and welcome to this edition of The Fourth Gear, sponsored by Classic Auto Insurance. Today, I have a, a very special guest, which probably doesn't need much introduction, Mr. Wayne Carini. Wayne, thank you for joining us today. Great to be with you. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about your career. You, you got the car bug very early on. I heard that you drove your first car at a very early age. Yeah, you know, my we had a family farm, so I was brought up as long as my feet could touch the pedals on the tractor, I was hired um, because <laughs> we, we had a fruit farm and, and we needed uh, as many uh, people working for free as possible. So uh, I, I was hired. And of course, I was thrilled. You couldn't make to have, have a job driving a tractor at like seven years old. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And then, and then uh, we, we had lot cars that we'd have old junk cars that we drove through the uh, fields and through the orchards. So that's how that started. And then when I was about 13 years old, I made my own keys to my mother's 61 Starfire Oldsmobile convertible and started driving that when my parents would go to the movies on Wednesday nights. <laughs> so, um, I got my start and then of course uh, in the driveway steering the car and making my sisters push the car so I, I would pretend I was driving. That didn't work out one day really well though uh, because uh, we got called uh, up for breakfast in the morning and uh, I, I ran upstairs and during breakfast we heard this horrendous crash and I'd left the car in neutral and it rolled over the bank and smashed into a tree and my father, he couldn't understand how that could happen because he had parked the car the evening before and could swear that he put the emergency brake on. And my sisters ratted me out. So. <laughs> Siblings but, are yeah. great that way. Yeah, well, they were pressured, I'm sure. When it, when did you realize that that you were going to go down the automotive road? I mean, you you, you grew up, you went to college. You, I believe you were going to teach if if, I, if my research is correct. Yeah, you know, during high school, I, I sort of wanted a different career path than my father had because I saw him working seven days a week and and 16 hours a day sometime. And, and you know, I said, boy, I, I don't think I want to do that, even though I loved cars and, and was really into hot rods and, and foreign cars and every type of car. So I, I won a contest in the Hartford Home Builders Association for my design of a home and, and a, a little model I built. And I thought all of a sudden I was an architect. So I went to architecture school for uh, one semester and realized that it wasn't going to be for me because I, I didn't look at the fine print when I was signing up to go to college for that, that said, you have to be there for seven years in order to get your certificate to become an official architect. And I, and I realized I wasn't for school going to be uh, in school that long. I, I wanted something to do. So I, my fallback was going to uh, school to become an art education was, was my career. And I couldn't find a job I really wanted. Uh, I wanted to be all of a sudden a college art teacher, you know, right out of college. And uh, that wasn't going to happen. So teaching elementary school art wasn't wasn't my, it wasn't on my plate. So I went back to work for my dad. And as they say, the rest is history. And your dad at that point, he, did he, uh, you say you went back to work for your dad. Were you talking about the farm, the orchard? Are you talking about? So, no, no. So my, my uncles and my grandfather had the orchards, but my father had the cow barn on the property that turned into his restoration shop. He's very successful in that. And re he restored Duesenbergs and Packards and Lincolns and Model A Fords. And he was the founder of the Model A Ford uh, Restores Club of America back in 1951. So he was really immersed in this. And we take the cars at different shows all over the country, uh, especially Hershey every year, where we would win first in our class. And, and, you know, it was just, it was that normal restoration type of a lifestyle. You know, if we weren't restoring cars, we were showing them and, and driving them. And so I went back to work for him at his restoration shop, never thinking that it was going to be my career. And then I was really into Ferraris as a young person and uh, into Formula One racing. And so we would go down to Luigi Kennedy Motors on Sundays and he'd let me look in the window as a young kid and see all the Ferraris. So one day, one of his clients bought a brand new Ferrari Daytona and he'd, he hit guardrails with the right side of the car. So here I am, I'm 18, 19 years old, and he gave me the car to fix. He says, you know how to fix this. So you, go ahead. 
it's, it's your project. And so that really got me going on fixing Ferraris. And then when I went back to work for them, that Ferrari restoration aspect became really large. And I hooked up with a gentleman, Francois Sicard, who was a very well-known restorer. And he and I restored cars together for approximately 25 years and showed them all over the country. And I got a great reputation. And, and then that just blossomed from there. And, and Canetti was the, I believe he was the first dealer to bring Ferraris into the country in New York. Is that correct? Luigi Canetti Sr. was a race director at Alfa Romeo. And then he, he became a very famous driver himself working for Enzo Ferrari. And he won the 1949 Le Mans in, in a Ferrari Barchetta, which was the first major race that Ferrari had ever won, which really put him on the map. And, and Enzo said that, you know, we, we really need to build cars in order to afford to go racing. So Kennedy said, I'll go to the United States and I'll sell cars. And because that market is really eager and hungry for, for sports cars, yep. which he did. And he became the United States importer for Ferrari until 1973. And, you know, as you talked earlier about, you know, you didn't want to get into a lifestyle where you're working seven days a week and you're doing all this stuff. Yet the industry that we're in, and I am going to all these events, like you're going to all these events, um, it, it is a seven day a week job. We're, we're every weekend, we're traveling somewhere. It seems like an eight day a week job, but, but you know what, it's, it's so enjoyable. If you're so passionate about cars, it's not a job at all. It's just, and that's, that's what I think really turned the corner for me. It became so enjoyable for me to be able to, and when you, when you're a restorer or, or you're an artist seeing the end result of your efforts and then sharing it with other people. So for instance, an artist, they, they paint a painting and it sits in someone's home or it goes to a gallery, it's in a museum. It's the same thing with cars. It's, it's like a painting that you're bringing to an automobile show and you're sharing it with others and you're seeing their reaction to it. And, and that, that's what drives us every day is, is, that, is that sharing of ideas and of, of cars with other people. And it's, you know, challenging on the family life. You've been married a long time. Uh, you have children. You know, how, how did you find that balance early on with, with your schedule? Well, I started in the business and I wasn't married. Uh, I didn't get married until I was in my 30s and uh, I was already established. So my wife understood. We dated for four years before we got married. So she saw the whole routine and understood it. And she's not really into cars at all. She's a real family person. And uh, so I, I lucked out. We've been married for 38 years now. And well, it's, it's wonderful to have that balance of home and cars. I think it's, it, it really works well for us. She allows me to do the things that I love and uh, I support her in what she does, which is take care of our family. So it, it works for us and, and it's, it, it, it seems to have been the, the best choice. And your base is Portland, but Portland, Connecticut, not, yeah. Portland, not the other Portland on the other side of the coast. Um, and you also, uh, you have a dealership, is that correct? Where you do sell classic cars. Yeah, so F40 Motorsports is the name of the dealership. I started that in the 80s and early 90s, and I named it F40 because at that time I had a, an F40 that I bought that it was in an accident, and I fixed it, and I kept the car. And then as the, as the shop needed more equipment, of course, the F40 had to go. But I've had the three other ones over the period of time. Now they're sort of out of reach because now they're $2 million, $3 million car. Yep. So I, I choose not to have. I, I look back and say I really enjoyed having them and, and not lusting for one anymore. Now, your passion kind of grew. What, what's the car that you sought after the most and did you get it? Well, my ultimate car, I have two answers to that. The ultimate car, if I had no other car in the world and I had to have just one car, would be a 250 short wheelbase Ferrari 1960. I've restored eight of them, and I've had the pleasure of being able to drive them and get to know them really well. And I think that's probably the ultimate car for me. It's so beautiful as well as it, it drives so well. So, But my, you know, people say, what's your favorite car? And my answer is always the next one. <laughs> As we say in my television show, it's all about the chase. And, and it really is. I think that everybody's in that same boat. 
you know, my friend Richie Klein always said, cars are great. You lust after them, you find them, you finally buy them. And then after a while, they become another can of peas on the shelf and you're chasing the next one. So I think that's a good explanation. Well, and that's a great segue into my next question. Your television program that's been on at least 15 seasons, maybe longer at this stage of the game. It is enjoyed by so many generations. You have, you've had a way or figured out the combination to get from the younger millennial group all the way up to, to our group to really watch what you're doing, to really get, you know, I, I've watched a lot of your episodes. And, you know, the other day I was watching one and you were after an old motorcycle. I think it was a 1912 American motorcycle that a family had owned for a long, long time. Maybe, I think it was the original buyer. The dad was the original buyer of the motorcycle. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah, no, I found that up, up in Boston, just outside of Boston, a basement next to the uh, furnace in the basement. But, uh, you know, those are the experiences. Of we Basically, it's I'm very, very fortunate that the, the show is not scripted. Nobody tells me what to do. It's just how, what I do with, uh, in my business and in my life. And uh, we don't, there's no swearing, there's no, nothing, and it's not fake. It's not, nothing's placed there because we found something and it looks cool in this barn. It's as it is, it's reality. <clears throat> and I think that that's so important that we br brought people along on this journey. And I think also what's important is, is that it's not a show about one type of car. There's no, nothing wrong with that. So it's not about just Camaros or not just about Mustangs or not just about Duesenbergs. It's about every type of car and every type of motorcycle in the world. And that's what I love. I love everything with wheels. And, and I think we bring that through. So. Every time someone turns a show on, they always go, well, what's going to be this week? What, what did he find this time? You know, and, and I think that that adds a lot of value to the show. And, and you, you're capturing some of the real life experiences. <laughs> I've seen you out when you're getting one of the cars. I forget what the car was. It was a big classic car and it's like 10 degrees or maybe five degrees below zero. It was very, very cold. The car wouldn't crank. You couldn't get it off the truck and it's freezing outside, but it captured you because that's, that's, that's what you go through. That's just part of the chase. That's part of the experience of the get the car, bring it home and restore it. Well, and, and that's so important is, is, is again, being real, it's reality, you know, and, and you're not fake about anything. So and, and it goes through uh, what comes to my mind is we had three Boyd Coddington cars going through Meekum's auction. And one of the cars hadn't been driven a long time and it got right up to being on the block. It's the next car and the front brakes locked up, <sighs> you know? So, so what do you do? I mean, you know, you've got to do something. And so I, I immediately said, okay, anybody got a pair of vice grips or something. And so we scurried around and crawled under the car and I broke the bleeder and it released the brakes. So uh, the guy that was driving it, I said, now drive it up on stage, but don't slow down. Just sort of go slow across the block. Don't stop. Don't hit the brakes because they'll lock up again. It's just a hose, you know, and it's, it's logic. So the rubber hose is swelled up inside. It allows the brake fluid to go to the brake caliper, but not to return. So it, it stays locked up. So you relieve the pressure of the brake caliper in the car drove. But these are the things you don't count on. But yet, and, and, the, and my film crew is so good about showing that kind of stuff. You know, our cameraman, Gordy, is just so good. He'll, he'll crawl underneath the car with me immediately. You know, it's not a setup shot where, you know, we're saying, okay, Gordy, the brakes are going to lock up over here. So you get under the car with Wayne. It's just, we work well together and, and know each other's movements, I guess. Yeah. So I've been really fortunate. Our show's been on for 18 seasons and over 200 episodes and we're now shown in 52 countries around the world it's just it's an amazing thing how it took off and it became so popular so but I think uh, a lot yeah of that coolness that you have i've seen we we're at a at, i want to say we were at the boca concor a year or two ago and you and ralph morano were doing a seminar and you guys I'm totally unscripted. You guys were just going back and forth, bannering back and forth. You know, there's just no way of being able to write how you're going to present something. But you guys were just hilarious. I think it was one of the best seminars I've ever been to in my life, watching you two guys go at it. Yeah, and, well, when you got a great friend like I have and Ralph, it's easy to, to joke around together. We do it. I, I just got off the phone with him an hour ago. And, you know, we're whacking away at each other, but it's a lot of fun. We, we have a ball doing it. 
But uh, people say, how do you know what you're going to talk about when you give a speech? And I said, I really don't know. I just stand up there and I, whatever comes to my mind. I, I always remember, you know, talking to automotive people, it's pretty easy because everybody loves cars. That's your audience. But I spoke at a banker's convention once and there was over 250 bankers there. After I gave my speech, a couple of guys came up to me and says, that's the best speech we've ever had at one of these conventions. And I said, why is that? How can you tell? He says, nobody got up and left. <laughs> he said, normally during these speeches, people start talking amongst each other. They go to the men's room. They don't come back. He says, no one left and no one talked. They listened to you intensely. So I don't know what it is, but if, if you just talk from your heart and just, and, and, and I think that that's the best way to do it. No notes, just get up and talk. And you've been to about every major event across the country. You know, I, I don't know how much you travel. At one point I was traveling 38 <laughs> weeks out of the year. I was seeing you everywhere. So you had to be right there with me. What's one of your most fondest memories of, of all your adventures that, that, that comes to mind, the story you like to tell the most? Well, I think, you know, finding certain cars, uh, people say, what's your best find ever? I, I, I think really probably the Stutz Bearcat I found down in Statesboro, Georgia. A gentleman called me one day and he was turkey hunting down on this big plantation. And he looked in the barn in the garage window and he saw this car and he asked the guy what kind of car it is. And he said, well, it's a Stutz Bearcat. So he let him take a look at it. And he called me, he says, I just found a Stutz Bearcat today. I said, well, did, did you take any pictures of it? He says, no. I said, how do you know it's a Stutz he's a Bearcat? He says, well, it says Stutz in the radiator. And the guy says, it's a Bearcat. So what do I know? <laughs> I said, well, I said, uh, could you take some pictures of it? And he said, well, it's three, three hours away from me. I said, I'll make it worth your while. I'll give you a thousand dollars if you go take pictures. So he got in the, in the truck and went and took pictures of it. And it was a Stutz Bearcat. I was there two days later and I was only there for about an hour and I owned it. Wow. And I'd set up my friend. So sometimes people get second thoughts about selling something, you know, you let it sit for a week and next thing you know, you know, they send your check back to you. I'm a big believer in as soon as the deal is done and you wire the man the money, you, you remove it from the property immediately. And so I called my friend Andy Green and, and he's in Savannah. And I said, Andy, I'm going to buy this car at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I need you there with a the trailer at the end of the guy's driveway. So when, when it's officially mine, you pull in and we remove it. And uh, so after the deal was done, I said to the guy, I said, okay, you got the money in your account. Can I take the car? He says, yeah, sure. So I said, well, I've got a friend of mine from Savannah. He's going to come and pick it up. And then Andy pulled in the driveway 10 minutes later. And he said, that was the fastest trip from Savannah I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Savannah about an hour and a half away. So, but I think that, and then, and then Ralph and I driving it in New York city, we had done a, a chowder society talk and we drove the car in from my trailer into the city and driving down fifth Avenue. And, and uh, being able to be in New York City with a car, of course, it was kind of nerve wracking with all the buses and everything going around me. But that was really cool. And then probably the, the other one was, is that I'd restored a, a Ferrari for Luigi Canetti uh, Jr. of 365P, which is the, the Monoposto, which is the center steering, Triposti, I mean, the center steering car with two seats next to it. And uh, my, one of my favorite cars growing up and going down to Kennedy Motors and looking in the window. And then I finally got to restore the car for him. And we took it to Pebble Beach. And so to drive my favorite car on the lawn with my wife on one side of me and my best friend on the other side of me, that was a pretty super experience, I'll tell you. That's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. So, so, so going to car shows are, are, are always fun and, 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 and seeing what's new and different. That's what I like. I like going to see, and especially at Pebble Beach. I, I walk around Pebble Beach and I've been pretty good. I've, I've been probably 25 out of 30 picks. I pick the best in show every year and my, my odds are pretty well. So with those odds, I should go to the casino, I guess. For someone who's looking to perhaps buy their first car, what advice would you give them? So the advice I give young people when they're going to buy their first car, and, and I, I don't want to talk down certain makes and models, but for instance, if, if a young person comes in and I say, what are you interested in? They say, well, I like Mustangs or I like Camaros. I said, well, that's, that's fine, but go to any car show and count how many Mustangs are there or count how many Camaros are there. 
I said, my advice is buy something that people have never seen or not seen in a long time. So buy yourself a, a Rambler or, or, a, or a Pinto or, or something that's unusual that people will talk about. And they'll come to you instead of you just being one of a mass of people. Find something that's unique and unusual. And then it, you'll get to be known because people will talk to you and next thing you know, and then go out and buy that Mustang. Uh, but yet to begin with, so people will know you, find something unique and unusual. That's, that's awesome advice. Some of our closing thoughts, tell us a little bit about Team Carini. You, you've put together this great organization and how do people join? How do people get involved with what you're doing and what are some of the benefits? So uh, with Team 464, which is kind of, uh, it's, it's the name of our uh, fan group, basically. So, so many people want to know where I'm going to be next and what I'm doing. And so they can go to waynecarini.tv and find out, you know, our schedule of where, what events I'm going to be at. And then uh, we have uh, the ability to become a team member where you get podcasts or Zoom calls with me once a month. We do newsletters to, to let them know about things. We have a new magazine called The Chase, which we have fantastic writers. Bill Warner is one of the writers, Ed Welburn, Jay Ward. So that's part of the package that you get is the magazine. It's a beautiful it. magazine. It's four color. It's glossy. It's, it's gorgeous, gorgeous. The photography is gorgeous. The layouts are gorgeous. I mean, it's not just a magazine you pick up off the newsstand. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we're very fortunate. Uh, Russ Rockneck, who was uh, the editor and founder of Mesh New England, about the uh, car scene in New England, and uh, I joined forces with the, my other group, uh, my other members of, of our team, and we, we, we transformed his Mesh magazine into the chase and got all sorts of great writers, and the photography is great. Yeah, we're real, real proud of the magazine, and it's, and it's really the subscription rate's really increasing, so that's good. I've got a podcast that I'm doing right now with Jay Ward talking classic cars, or classic car talk, I should say, that we're actually recording a segment this afternoon. So Jay Ward is the technical director of Pixar Studios and a great hot rod buddy and friend of mine. Uh, so he and I are doing that. And uh, Chasing Classic Cars just finished uh, filming our, our last season, so that's in the can and waiting for Motor Trend to, to give us the green light to show that. So we're also doing two more uh, digital shows that are going to be coming out, Wayne Carini on the road. And then uh, we've just pitched uh, another show for uh, Roku. So um, uh, not that I'm not busy enough, but uh, <laughs> I'm doing all these things. And, and of course, uh, running my business, uh, the sales, and then the restoration business. But I have a good team to help me with that every day. So yeah, I'm very fortunate, but the Team 464 is really a great organization and we meet and for instance, we gave a tour at Bonham's auction recently at Hershey, we gave a great tour. So we, we take our members behind the scenes, so to speak, and give them a private tour or, or get together wherever, whatever big shows we're at. So yeah, it's really, it's really it's awesome. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, uh, gosh, I swear to God, you're the busiest guy in the business. And yet you still, I've seen you be approached a million times. It's hard for you to walk across the field, but you're always so gracious. You take time, you talk to everybody and you're, you're just, you're, you're, you're an amazing person for the hobby. And, and I thank you for that very much. And I, I, I thank you very much for being on our broadcast this morning. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. And it's always a pleasure to meet and greet the fans of the show and, and talk to them. I know that they get very excited. Television's a, a powerful media, and, and uh, once they see someone on television, it's almost like they know them. And then, you know, for them to come up and, and be so gracious to want a picture with me and, and have my signature, it just blows me away. I, I still don't get that whole thing, you know. Just a simple guy just happened to uh, luck out one day to be on television, and, and then it grew into this monstrous thing. But uh, thank you for having me on your, uh, on your podcast today. Well, thank you very much. And that's it with Wayne Carini. Uh -huh.